Good morning, grade 11s. Today is my one day late class for Corona Chem Day 30. Yesterday I was traveling and I wasn't able to um, do a class. So this is for period one, grade 11, U and AP and 12C. It is the class that I should have given Friday, May the 15th. Today is Saturday, May the 16th. And is it, it, it is about water. We have some interesting questions to look at today. Here are some notes about water. The Earth's surface is 72% water. The volume of the ocean is 1.35 times 10 to the 9 kilometers cubed. So 1.35 billion, so 1 billion 350 million kilometers cubed of water on the, on the Earth. That's enough to fill a cube that would be 1,105 kilometers in height. So just imagine a cube made of water over a thousand kilometers in height. That's how much water there is on the earth. Or it'd be enough to make a sphere. If you had a, a, a planet made completely out of water, it would be uh, using only the water from the earth. It would be 1,371 kilometers in diameter. Another interesting fact is that 97.2% of the earth's water is in the ocean. 2.8 to about 2.1% is in the form of ice and glaciers and only 0.6 percent is fresh water and even that is still an enormous amount of water if you look at the great lakes go stand at the shores of lake ontario and you'll see how much fresh water there is amazing thing as well is that canada probably has more fresh water than all the other nations combined with our great lakes lake superior ontario erie michigan uh and huron i think i may have left one out but anyway we have a lot of water we have a lot of fresh water um, about water, one kilogram of ocean water contains about 35 grams of salt. And this is a very interesting question. Could we do something with that salt? The answer is yes. If we marshal our resources carefully, and, and of course, as the population of the earth will continue to increase, uh, unless some people get their way who are trying to reduce population, which I totally disagree with, by the way. The whole notion that we have to reduce population is so contrary to everything you find in the Bible that any, any real Christian would have a very serious concern uh, regarding people who feel the need that we have to reduce population. And they usually what they usually in, engage in is policies that are overseas, you know, they'll, they'll send contraceptives overseas or, or they'll, they'll use vaccination programs that are uh, uh, supposedly curbing um, fertility, which I find absolutely unacceptable. It is horrific that anybody should think that they have the right to control the fertility of others. And if you listen to the church, you'll see that the church has some pretty clear ideas on that, the Catholic church. The other church is not so much, only the Catholic church. And that's my contribution to Catholic education. I'm a science teacher, don't you forget it. But I'm also a Catholic man. Don't you forget that. I won't let you anyway, don't worry. So, one kilogram. Marker's dying. Get a brand new one. One kilogram of ocean water contains about 35 grams of salt. And you'll have chloride, uh, sodium, you'll have sulfate, You'll have magnesium, which is a very useful metal in its own right. Magnesium is used to make alloys with aluminum. You have calcium, potassium. There's carbon dioxide in the water as well. There are bromides. There's, what is that, boric acid, H3PO3. Strontium cations. 
There's even some fluoride, mind you, it's at low concentrations, it's uh, 7.0 times 10 to the minus 9 moles, so it's a pretty low concentration. <coughs> the chloride concentration is around 0.55 molar, and the sodium concentration is about 4, 47 molar. Now, seawater, obviously you can't drink it because our kidneys don't have enough pressure to osmotically desalinate the water. Although there are animals that can drink seawater. I think the kangaroo rat can drink seawater and survive. Nobody, uh, no other creatures that I know of can drink water that has that high a, of a salinity. If you drink seawater, you'll actually uh, become more thirsty and you'll, you'll uh, damage your osmotic balance. It can actually... Uh, if you drink enough, it'll, it'll kill you. So desalination is a technique that is used to make fresh water out of seawater. There are a number of techniques, but two popular ones. There's distillation, and there is reverse osmosis. Those are the two techniques that are used to produce fresh water in areas where, if you, say if you live in the desert, uh, like you see in the... Uh, northeastern parts of Africa, there's very little fresh water. It's at the edge of a desert, but there's plenty of ocean water, so they use their abundant oil reserves to power desalination plants that can either use distillation or reverse osmosis. Little, little known fact that, that, may, may, that might make you smile. You know when you buy all those bottles that have uh, nice pictures of mountains with snow-capped peaks, and it says, you know... Uh, um, spring water from the mountains of whatever i worked as i worked as a forklift driver for a couple of weeks in one summer and i saw every one of those types of bottles all the different types were coming to the same place they were coming to a still it was a big still they were boiling tap water they were using distillation there's nothing wrong with distillation it makes pure water it just made me laugh that they put this label on the bottle after they made it look like there's some kind of exotic location they were getting the water from i don't know what the laws for water are in Canada, but they seem pretty lax if you ask me. I think that's called false advertisement. If you put a label on there that leads the consumer to think that that water comes from some exotic location somewhere else in the world, it doesn't. It comes from the tap water, which they purified by distillation. And I saw all the different types of bottles, all kinds, the big blue ones, the glass bottles, there was all kinds of different bottles, all coming from all over the city of Toronto to that central location. They were being refilled with water. You know, I wasn't that scandalized, but it made me it made me laugh. It, well, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the food industry that maybe should be regulated a little more carefully because, yeah, they have to put the ingredients on there, but who, who even knows what that means, half the stuff. Maybe this should be legislated. If I was in charge, they would be legislated to uh, have a monograph in the in the uh, in the store so that you could take a piece of paper and say well this is the danger associated with this ingredient this is the danger associated with that ingredient so that people could inform themselves because just listing the ingredients if you're not a chemist or a biochemist you're not going to know half what half of that stuff is capable of doing anyway back to uh, water an interesting calculation that i thought of last night and i want to share with you that uh, deals with uh water you know that battery technology is continually improving. They 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 and they're they're using more and more and more of it to make electric cars and even batteries for home use. Uh, I asked myself the question: Just how much lithium is in the ocean water? Because lithium is becoming a very important metal industrially. So I said, now what if what if I was to take a cubic mile of water and extract all the uh, lithium from it? How much would I get? So I looked up a paper on, uh, on the internet that said the average content of lithium in seawater. And here's what I got. And I made a question out of it, and then I answered the question just for fun. So here's the question. How tall a cube of lithium could be made by extracting all the lithium.
cubic mile, meaning pretend you had a big cube, a mile tall, a mile wide, and a mile long, and you filled it with water. That's a cubic mile of water. So here's a few conversion factors you're going to need. So given that one mile equals 5,280 feet, one foot equals 12 inches, one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, one kilometer equals a thousand meters, one meter equals 100 centimeters, and that the concentration of lithium in seawater is equal to 183 micrograms per liter of water. Also, you'll need to know that the density of lithium, it's a pretty low density metal, is equal to 0.535 grams per centimeter cubed. Also, you should know that one meter cubed is 1,000 liters of water. Okay, so with those conversion factors, you have everything you need to answer the question. Here's the answer. I might have to, I might have to uh, erase. I'll just do the conversion for now to find out how many uh, micrograms of uh, lithium is in the water, and then I'll erase and put the rest of the answer because it won't all fit. So one mile cubed times 5280 <coughs> feet per one mile. That's not coronavirus. That cough is because I was exposed to uh, dust. I wood chipped 1.6 tons of branches with my father the other day. We breathed in a lot of dust. It was good though. It was good exercise. But it made a lot of dust. 2.54 centimeters per one inch. Also, I'm cubing all the conversion factors because we're dealing in three dimensions, length, width, height. So you gotta do the conversion factor to the power of three. And then there's one meter per 100 centimeters. Again, that's cubed. So here you're multiplying all these quantities cubed. Here you're dividing that quantity cubed because it's in the denominator. And finally, there are 1,000 liters in one meter cubed. Now you're going to know how many liters there are in one cubic mile of water. It comes out to 4.168 times 10 to the 12 liters of water. And if the concentration of the lithium is 183 micrograms per one liter, liters will cancel and you're going to find out that you have 7.62 seven 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 two seven four times ten to the fourteen micrograms of lithium and uh, there's one gram for every ten to the six micrograms and one kilogram for every thousand grams so that's going to give us an answer in uh, kilograms of lithium so we'll put that up here top you're going to have from that 762,777.274 kilograms of lithium and if you want that in tons times one ton per thousand kilograms. Basically, you know, let's round it off to three sig figs because uh, this is only three sig figs. So it's 763 tons of lithium. So one cubic mile of water, if you dried all the water out so that it concentrated the salt down into a brine, you could then do some electrolytic extraction. I'm not saying it wouldn't be expensive. It would be expensive to 
extracted, but if you let the sun do all the hard work of evaporating the mile cubed of water, then you could theoretically could, you know, concentrate that salt down to a brine and then you could put it into all, gather it up, put it in a, into a container and do electrolysis at the right voltage and extract the lithium at a high rate of recovery. Uh, lithium goes for something like $16,000 a ton. So I calculated last night there'd be a $12 million worth of lithium in one cubic mile of water. It sounds like a lot of money, but it would take a lot of money to mess around with a cubic mile of water. I once did a calculation on how much, it, how long it would take to use up a cubic kilometer of water if you used it at a rate of one ton per second. It would take 32 years. So we're talking large scale operation here. It wouldn't be something that you'd just do in a, you know, overnight. If you wanted to make a pond, say, to evaporate the water, I did a quick calculation where the pond, if you made the water a foot deep, if you made the water this deep, the pond would have to be 20 miles one way and 20 miles the other way. So you'd have basically a small lake. And then you would, uh, you would let the water sit there until all the water evaporated, the salt would stay behind, and then you could scrape it up or do it, have some technique. So creating that kind of operation w would require earth, uh, earthworks to be done. You know, you'd have to build a dam inland and then get a canal that would channel ocean water into the area so that you could shut it on or off to bring in new water to, re to redo the process. But sometime in the not so far future, we're going to be, we're going to be needing a lot of lithium because the batteries are going to be, uh, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of batteries everywhere. So I don't know, is anybody out there with lots of money listening? This my, I have ideas if you want to listen. Uh, Happy to help out. Uh, so density, let's find out how big this cube is. Density equals mass over volume. Therefore, volume is equal to mass over density. And uh, you, need, you have 762,777.274 kilograms of lithium. Uh, times a thousand grams, let's go back to grams because that's what they give you the density in, grams per centimeter cube, uh, kilogram per kilogram, and then the density of the lithium is 0 0.535. So I rearranged the density equation to solve for the volume. The volume of the cube would be 1.425571991 times 10 to the nine centimeters cubed. And if you were to find the length of a cube, let's say you make that all that lithium into a cube. Uh, if you take the cube root, you get the length of the one edge of the cube or the height of the cube, whatever you like. It gives you 1.12550645 times 10 to the three centimeters. So the cube would be you convert the meters, one meter per hundred centimeters, the cube would be 11.3 meters in height. So a cubic mile of seawater would produce enough lithium if it was fully extracted, and like that's a, <laughs> that's a big jump, but okay, all the details, uh, let's jump over all the details. Let's suppose you could extract 100% of it what you would get is a cube of a lithium 11.3 meters in height. Not to mention um, there are other uh, potentially valuable metals in seawater. There's gold, there's magnesium, uh, every metal of, of, of uh, technological interest can be found in seawater because seawater uh, leaches it from all the surface rocks on the earth. You know, rainwater trickles down mountains, it trickles along uh, rock beds and soil, and it, it, it leaches these chemicals at very low concentrations, but this has been happening for four and a half billion years. Where do all rivers end up? They end up in the ocean. So over the course of billions of years, the concentration of minerals leached from the surface of the earth has steadily risen and the ocean is a huge reservoir, potentially, of minerals for future generations of human beings.
We should never have the idea that the, the way of fixing uh, problems of supply is by reducing the number of humans. That is the result of a twisted morality. Human beings are sacred. Every life is sacred. You have to fix the problem by moving things, not human beings. Beware of scientists who propose theories without morality. That's what you get. You get dangerous people. Technology has to progress at the same rate as moral development. As your technology increases in sophistication, your moral development, your capacity to say, no, this is wrong, has to increase commensurately, or else you end up having technocracies where the, the business and the, and the scientific end of things takes over and then moral considerations are swept aside. We have that happening right now in our society and it's a scary thing because when technocracies take over, they start thinking that they have the right, right way of thinking and they, have, they can force everybody else to do what they think is right and usually there's a lot of death involved. Nobody's allowed to kill anybody else, bottom line. Nobody's allowed to kill anybody else and if you think you're allowed to kill people, there's something wrong with the way you're thinking. Fresh water. The book that I'm uh, using is a U.S. book, so we're using U.S. statistics. U.S. has about 1.7 times 10 to the 15 liters of fresh water. 41% is used in agriculture. 39% is used in hydroelectric projects to generate electricity. 6% is used in industry. 6% is used in households. And 1% is used for drinking. I have to say, I'm not very impressed by these statistics about fresh water. Uh, whenever you have something that is valuable to everyone, there's always going to be someone who tries to turn it into a means of generating money for themselves. Water is for everyone. It's a necessity for everyone. There's no living creature that can do without water. So when you get somebody trying to control water, I would say raise the alarm. What, I mean, what do I mean by controlling water? I mean... Uh, holding it to themselves, acquiring rights to it, and then doling it out as they see fit. Water is put on the earth by God for everyone. Nobody owns the water. And I've always had a problem with people who think, well, this is our water, we're gonna do what we want. No, we have to use that water as though it belongs to everyone. So obviously don't pollute it, don't acquire it, and then sell it back to us. The, the idea of people buying water to drink was always something that rub me the wrong way too. And not that I like to drink a lot of water. I'm not one of those people who drinks eight glasses of water a day like they used to say all the time because the tap water that we have is also contaminated to a low level, but it is contaminated. So uh, I prefer to drink the amount I need to avoid thirst and not overdo it because by drinking a lot, whatever contaminant you have in the water, you're bringing more of it into your body. So the total amount of fresh water on earth <clears throat> is not a large fraction of the total water present, but it is entirely adequate if properly managed. Proper sewage treatment is the key to maintaining the health of the population, as was discovered in 19th century London. You know, they used to throw their garbage out the window and it would end up in the street, and the streets were a stinking mess. The same thing happened in Rome 2,000 years ago. Sewage treatment is an absolute must, and it, and it has to increase in sophistication <laughs> as the population increases because when you concentrate people into cities they, they create a, a veritable flood of waste and that waste has to be managed it has to and it can be managed if you do things properly you add bacteria to it you put it in uh, ponds where it can ferment and decompose properly until it becomes harmless until all the pathogenic organisms have died off or have run their course and, and are no longer dangerous uh, and then you can use the effluent as manure and recycle it back onto farmers fields or, or in the gardens of people who want to grow their own food, etc. So 
there is a way of doing things, and, and uh, city, most cities have it down pretty good, uh, except when there's budget cutbacks and then things happen that shouldn't happen. You know, there have been various disasters over the years. I, I can think of one, the Walkerton crisis, where the, uh, the chlorinator for the, for the uh, municipal water stopped working or was prop not properly attended, and a bunch of people... Uh, ended up drinking water that was contaminated with coliforms. Coliforms are bacteria that grow in the colon. And you may be immune to your own coliforms, but you're not necessarily immune to the coliforms of other people. And there's multiple varieties of, of bacteria that reside in people's guts. Uh, so anytime you're drinking water laced with feces, you can, you can imagine it's not going to work out well. Um, an important thing about water is that it should have oxygen in it. And oxygen does dissolve in water. A, a small amount of it does dissolve in water. That's how the fish breathe. They have gills. They pass the water over the gills, and the gills extract the oxygen into their system. When oxygen saturated water, meaning when you're at the maximum amount of water uh, of oxygen that water can contain at around 20 degrees Celsius, it'll contain about nine parts per million, and that's plenty for fish to breathe. Cold water fish only require about five parts per million. So, ex but excessive organic material in the water, especially if it's metabolically active, will use up the oxygen because bacteria too will use up the oxygen and they'll deplete the oxygen. And then if the fish swim into that water, they have no oxygen to breathe, they can die. If they don't come out of the water that's low in oxygen, they die, they go belly up and they, they decompose and they make the water quality drop even more. Uh, if the water has very low oxygen, it's taken over by bacteria that work without oxygen called anaerobic bacteria and they tend to make uh, stinky breakdown products in the water so whenever you get for example if you have a pond and your pond doesn't have an aerator which is basically a pump that shoots water up in the air and makes it fall back down so that it, the air as the water is falling through the air it, it get it absorbs oxygen from the air and it contains it keeps the elevation it elevates the oxygen content of the water so fish can breathe and good organisms that are oxygen metabolizing can continue to exist in the pond if the pond becomes anaerobic it basically turns into a swamp the water starts to stink if you took if you if you go walking in it the mud at the bottom is going to smell bad and nobody likes to go swimming in a pond that smells like a like a cesspool Water can also be softened by the addition of uh, sodium carbonate uh, because it causes precipitation of the magnesium and calcium ions which cause, which cause the water to, to be hard. What does it mean to have hard water? It means water that when you try to wash yourself with it, the soap doesn't dissolve properly. It makes little curds and it precipitates and you end up having to use a lot more soap to get the same amount of clean, cleanliness. So they have ways of of, uh, of softening the water by removing the calcium and magnesium ions. You can even pass the water over special plastic beads called resin, anion exchange resins, and the resins have sodium ions in them. What happens is the calcium will go in and it'll release the sodium into the water. Sodium does not harden the water like calcium does. Calcium has a lot of insoluble products when it's in the water. So if you take the calcium out and replace it with sodium, the water is better for washing. So very often when you have a well in the country, uh, you might need to soften the water because it's hard to wash the dishes and hard to wash the clothing when you have lots of calcium dissolved in the water. It might be good to drink because calcium is good for you. It might even have a little bit of traces of iron. <coughs> so actually, well water could actually be good for you, uh, provided it hasn't got other chemicals like arsenic or fluoride or high levels of contaminants from, you know, uh, leachates from when the farmers put pesticides on the field to kill insects, if it, if it percolates all the way down to the aquifer where the water is that you get your well water from, then it could be a problem. So it's always good to test to make sure there's nothing in the water that would be uh, potentially dangerous. That's enough for today. I'm going to give you one question. Just one question. I'm going to ask you to show me the conversion from one kilometer. Here, I'll make it even better. And then I'll show you the... Uh, show the answer tomorrow. If, if the concentration of um, sodium, actually, let's make it more interesting. Let's pretend, I don't know what the actual concentration is, I'm going to pretend. Uh, let's assume 
the concentration of gold in seawater is 1.00 microgram per liter of water. So 183 times less than lithium. Uh, how much gold could you extract from one kilometer cubed of water? Okay, answer tomorrow. And you can use all the conversion factors that I showed you in that first question. It'll have a similar format. All right, see you tomorrow, or see you Monday.